This is a special edition of Government Matters Defense with Francis Rose from West 2018 in San Diego. Brought to you by Dell Technologies. Thanks for watching Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news, trends, and topics that matter to the business of government. Every Wednesday, we focus on defense. Welcome to part two of our coverage from the West 2018 conference in San Diego. I'm your host, Francis Rose. In a few minutes, you'll hear from some of the top officials at the Navy, Coast Guard, and Department of Defense. First, a quick look at industry's footprint at West 2018. Many of the contractors who traveled to San Diego showed off their latest tech, a field that moves at the speed of light. But good old-fashioned FaceTime remains critical to the relationship between DOD and industry. It's exciting to be in the robotics and drone space uh, and to where you're, you know, working to try to really make a difference. Trying to educate this community about the types of threats that you should be thinking about and the solutions for those threats as well. This is a great opportunity because we have the industrial base here. We have our vendors that we work closely with. We're close to the San Diego waterfront. That's our prime customer here. See the ships in the background today that we build. And at a conference like this is talking about the solutions we do uh, offer, but also getting that name out there. It gives us all a little bit of time to show the clients exactly what we've been doing. But the real benefit, I think, is being able to get in front of our government sponsors directly and hear them like the panel I just left. Hear what are their concerns, what are they working on in the next few years. The government industry partnership is vital. If you don't bring together the collective wisdom of the, of the broader ecosystem, then you're going to miss out on opportunities. The best answers always come when we think about the strategic partnership of what government needs and what industry best practices can bring to the table. We need to figure out how to not just have a bunch of great ideas and analysis, but how we get it down to the street level, how we get these things to move forward. Readiness and lethality have been common themes in Defense Secretary Jim Mattis' message to the defense community. The need for these two elements is critical in the U.S. Pacific Fleet, which has suffered in a number of collisions in the last year, killing nearly 20 sailors. I sat down with Admiral Scott Swift, commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet at the West 2018 conference, to assess his fleet's state of readiness and lethality. His perspective is much broader than, than mine because of the responsibilities that he has. So I just had the opportunity uh, to, to see him. He stopped through uh, Hawaii and we had a round table up at PACOM with Admiral Harris and the other component commanders. Then we had, uh, uh, as you would imagine, the focus was on readiness. But it was a very uh, broad, uh, wide-ranging discussion. Uh, one of national readiness, strategic readiness, operational readiness and tactical readiness. And so when he talks about readiness, he talks in terms about his engagement with Congress, you know, from a resourcing perspective. My focus is a here and now focus. As the Pacific Fleet Commander, I need to be ready for whatever challenge that we face today. It could be an HADR uh, uh, event, and that's a credibility piece. So if we're not able to respond as the Pacific Fleet, to an HADR event, what confidence do our allies, partners, and friends have in, a re in the region to our ability to respond in something that may be more consequential more broadly? Likewise, uh, those that uh, we are deterring, that, that we want to take a more balanced approach to security uh, in the region, um, how are they deterred if we're, if we're not able to, to respond in an HADR event? So my readiness focus is uh, on the forces that I have right now and their ability to engage across the spectrum of operations from phase zero operations all the way to, uh, to high-end combat operations. 60% of the Navy uh, belongs to me, 140,000 sailors. I know I can speak uh, on behalf of Admiral Harris, uh, my fellow component commanders, um, that the joint force in the Pacific is, uh, is ready for any contingency that may be uh, presented. And certainly as the Pacific Fleet Commander, I can attest to the readiness of the fleet to respond. What uh, lessons did you take away from the comprehensive review of recent surface force incidents relative to yeah. readiness? Well, there's a lot of lessons. And, and the first thing I would caution and uh, remind people of the efforts that the Undersecretary has taken, Undersecretary of Navy has taken along with the Vice Chief as co-chairs 
of uh, the, the board that has been formed, of which uh, Admiral Davidson and I are a part of, to make sure that we get beyond a punch list, checklist approach. So there was a number of specific uh, areas that Admiral Davidson identified needed to be fixed. Uh, and as well as the SRR, uh, which we need to consider that as well. There's two other documents that I consider. Uh, one is the Bilal report, and another is a report that uh, Admiral Copeman, uh, it's a, a confidential, but a vision that Admiral Copeman wrote in 2012, uh, vision uh, 2025 for the, uh, for the surface force. If you take all of those documents and stack them, it's compelling the level of overlap. So, and that is this discussion with SecDef, SecNav, CNO, and others have talked about the necessity of culture change. We can't just take a checklist approach. We have to take the culture change with respect to readiness, a balance of force generation and force execution. When your relief comes in, what will be the things that you speak to him or her about as top priorities in those areas? Well, first of all is, uh, is to make sure that the fleet understands uh, the depth and breadth of the capability that they have. You know, the challenge that, that we've had with uh, this introspective look that we've taken that resulted from the groundings and the three collisions, um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the fleet from a readiness perspective. I think this is why the SECDEF has uh, uh, spoken uh, so much about it down and in. I get the up and out to Congress and the other stakeholders. So um, that's why uh, when, when uh, the decision was made not to support me to go to PACOM, I made the comment um, that with the energy of Ensign, I an Ensign, I wanted to continue to surf forward at least until March uh, to put these measures in place to get the fleet on the optimum footing, giving the resources that we've had. And I think the new commander coming in, whoever that may be, is well positioned to continue that effort forward. You spoke a few moments ago about uh, the message that we're seeing, that we're sending to our allies in that, in yeah. that part of the world. Yeah. What do you think they're hearing as they hear all of the things that you're working through as, and, and we see the threat landscape yeah. involved there? So I think they're getting a confused message. Right now, uh, as we speak, we've got a uh, uh, combined maritime force commander's course uh, with uh, flag officers from 15, 20 different nations participating along with an equal number of U.S. Uh, flag officers that are participating. The majority of, of leaders in the foreign navies have come from this course, have, have the, had the benefit of that education. So that's one benefit of that. The other benefit is a great sounding board. So they, they're, they're just being bombarded with all these messages from the U.S., messages from China, from Russia, uh, from other consequential uh, powers from a global perspective. The world's in a very uncertain pace, place. You know, look at Brexit, look at the elections in, in Britain, the, it, where Germany is right now from a political perspective, uh, uh, Italy. I mean, I could draw a circle around the world. So you can't look at the, the challenges that our allies, partners, and friends in the Pacific are, are dealing with just from a Pacific construct. You have to look at it from a global perspective. That's why I'm such a strong uh, proponent and I'm so thrilled with the national security strategy and the national defense strategy about how it's been crafted. I know Abel Harris and myself have been focused on this for the three years that we've been in our, our current assignments. And we believe that the uh, NSS and the, uh, the national uh, defense strategy is an affirmation of that view that the most consequential challenge that we face right now is China. That, 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 that doesn't mean that we're on this, this path to war, or this path to conflict. I don't agree with those that suggest that. What that means is we need to engage in this competition from a, pay, a, a position of strength, back to your readiness discussion. That's why we have to stay focused on of the tactical, operational, and strategic readiness of the force. Admiral Swift, thanks very much for your time. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you much. Thank you very much for your time as well. And subsequent to my conversation with Admiral Swift, Vice Admiral John Aquilino was named as the nominee to replace him as commander of Pacific Fleet Command. Part two of our coverage from the West 2018 conference continues straight ahead on Government Matters. I'll sit down with the commanding officer of the Naval Information Warfighting Development Center next. At last year's West Conference, Captain John Watkins was named commanding officer of the Naval Information Warfighting Development Center. 
Since then, the center's achieved initial operating capability and scaled out in a major way. I talked to Captain Hawkins on the floor of this year's conference to talk about his first year on the job. Well, first and foremost, it's been an extreme honor and a pleasure to lead the Information Warfighting Development Center. Uh, we, we were successful. We achieved uh, inter what, what we call initial operational capability in March of last year. And uh, since then, we've, uh, we've really moved out remarkably considering our size, right? So, so when we first stood up, size, size was an issue because we only had so many billets. And, um, and some, of the, some of the highlights that we've had since we've started is uh, it, it's in accordance with our lines of operation, right? The number one uh, line of operation is to achieve advanced level training, right? To provide advanced level training. Uh, the second is to, is to move out in terms of doctrine, right? The Warfighting Development Centers become the, the clearing house for all doctrine relative to your particular information warfare area. Uh, so we've been successful there. Uh, we actually just, just in the last couple of months, Nywittick has been designated as the primary responsible authority for 61 pieces of doctrine. Okay, so that doctrine existed out there across the Navy, but we went out, we canvassed, right, we set the trap lines, looked at that and, and brought that back into house and, and certainly made the decision where that doctrine needed to reside. Mm -hmm. It was at the Nywittick, we were able to achieve that. Um, and then the third line of operation, which is probably the most significant, uh, significant because it correlates to my primary objective, is the establishment of uh, what I would call simply the Jedi Knights of information warfare. We're going to develop these warfare tactics experts and instructors. So the experts will be level four, the instructors will be all level five folks, okay? And, and it's coincidentally, it's, we're in the midst of the first IW information warfare baseline course, which is ongoing right now. It started on the 29th of January. It's a three-week course. We have 20 students in the course right now. Uh, and the end state goal will be out of those 20, we'll have basically three flavors of warfare tactics, uh, experts and instructors. We'll have intel operations, uh, we'll have electronic warfare, and we'll have what we call our assured C2, think in terms of information tech, uh, network, you know, expert ninja, and then a radio frequency you know, type ninja, which is looking at you know, SATCOM reliance and those kinds of things. So pretty excited about that. And then last but not least is the line of operation for assessment. And we've had some success there. We've been able to take existing doctrine, tactics, TTPs, procedures, um, revamp those, right, in, in, in lieu of what the fleet demand signal is right now, which is, you know, without getting into all the gory details, there, there's a lot of action going on out in the Pacific, for example, mm -hmm. just as much uh, on the Atlantic side. But we've been able to take uh, relevant, palatable doctrine and revise, revamp dynamically and then put it back out into the fleet and validate it, okay, in certain venues, high-end venues. Uh, and that's been, it's very innovative, right, because it's kind of what I call the wash, rinse, repeat process. And uh, that has been uh, tremendously beneficial to the fleet. And it's, in effect, it's created a kind of a, a cultural mindset, right, that all the different strike group staffs, as they're going through their workup process and their, their cycles with the OFRP process, um, we can leverage all that and harness it to really get at updated relevant doctrine. What are the primary drivers in the changes that are required in doctrine as you update it? Is it technology? Is it the threat landscape? Is it a combination of those things? Are there, it's what a, are the it's, other it's, factors? It's probably more of, of the latter, the, mm -hmm. the threat landscape, right? And so it's so a looking at, you know, what's out there um, and ensuring that our doctrine is suitable to meet, to meet the, the demand. Are you looking technology at- Technology is a part of it. Technology mm -hmm. is a part of it. Um, but technology comes at us so fast, right? So, so the key is when we think about uh, solutions, right? It, a part of the WDC is also to, to once we create those subject matter experts, those ninjas, if you will, who better in the fleet to identify yeah. complex, challenging issues to, and as we try to come up with solutions for those, it's gonna be a combination, right? It's gonna be a combination of, you know, what is the near-term threat? You know, what do we need to be tracking on? How can we leverage technology? I mean, there's so much technology out there but you've got to make sure that you're, you're pursuing the right technology, right? And it's a blend. I mean, all this technology is great, but you have, to, you have to understand the tactics, understand the threat, bring those two, couple them together, and, and deliver an optimal effect, right? So we do a lot of that in the WDC, do a lot of you know, brainstorming and whiteboarding and, and figuring that piece out. So it's very, very critical and core to what we do. 
we just have a couple of minutes left, that threat landscape as you assess it. Are you looking at specific actors, specific events, or are you trying to think more broadly or a combination of both? Uh, I, I would say more broadly because, I mean, we have to address all the various, the myriad of threats that are out there, okay? Yes, we have some recent, you know, um, you know, so world changes that, that you know, can, on any given day, it's a, you know, sort of like the Lord of the Rings, the eye, right? It moves, but, but the eye needs to encompass everything that's out there, okay? Whether it's asymmetrical, symmetrical, as, as adversaries, potential adversaries drive us to a more symmetrical type engagement, potentially, potentially. Yes. Um, so absolutely, have to be all, all, uh, all eyes open, all ears wide listening, uh, and look for solutions that are consistent, Okay, consistent across the Navy. And we want to make sure the doctrine, the doctrine that we're putting into play on the East Coast is the same doctrine that we're putting into play on the West Coast. Okay? And um, you know, sometimes that's not the case. So, so we want to we want to address that. Um, and certainly, again, take into, take into account all the threats that are out there. It has to be, you have to be a global mindset out of the box organization, I think, to be effective. Straight ahead on Government Matters, more coverage from the West 2018 conference. Colonel Greg Griffin, head of the Pentagon's Joint Regional Security Stacks program, details how all the military branches are assimilating. You're watching News Channel 8. Last year, the Pentagon's Joint Regional Security Stacks was subject to a formal operational assessment for the first time since it was stood up in 2013, the results were less than glowing. At West 2018, Colonel Greg Griffin, chief of the JRSS Program Management Office at the Defense Information Systems Agency, painted a picture of where the program stands this year. So Joint Regional Security Stack Program is uh, led by the DOD CIO, and it's to replace a lot of the aging and incons inconsistent architecture that they have uh, throughout all the post camp stations uh, globally for all of DOD with a much more modernized and standardized environment so that we have uh, all of our operators and all of our uh, defenders can work on this common terrain and share their TTPs and share their, their information that they uh, are able to glean from, the, from this new standardized architecture that they're able to, to, to operate on. And we're here at a big Navy show, and I understand Navy is kind of the latest to come along. Army and Air Force have already gone pretty far down the path to assimilation in its stacks, correct? Yes, so the, the Army started off uh, first, um, and they are the, definitely the, the furthest along in migrations. Now, there are two different types of migrations. There are the agency-level migrations, which uh, deal with only traffic that leaves an, uh, an agency or a service uh, to go to another agency or service. And then there is a base-level migration that, that actually um, inspects traffic that goes from one security enclave to another, even within the same post. So uh, the Army has taken a more aggressive approach with doing the, the base and agency migrations at the same time, and they're about halfway through. Uh, the Air Force has taken a different approach where they wanted to, the, the, to do their migrations at the agency level first in order to, to be able to replace their Air Force gateways. They're about halfway through that, uh, maybe a little bit more, uh, but they, they haven't started their base level migrations yet although their first two bases uh, should be going uh, at the end of third quarter. What's the Navy's status? What's their timeline look like? So the Navy and the, the Coast Guard have both just started their first uh, installations. Um, and so we are working through, as with each of the, new, the, the services and agencies that came on, uh, working through that initial friction of standing up the first of their kind. Mm -hmm. um, and so th they are uh, starting there. Um, the the Coast Guard uh, will be accelerating to, to two more bases uh, by the end of first quarter um, 19. And then the Navy will be continuing on their accepted network bases uh, as, they, as they proceed through this fiscal year. And next fiscal year, they'll get to their enterprise networks uh, a little bit later at the end of, uh, in the middle of 19. What are your customers telling you that they need from you as they're working through all of these transitions? So, the actual requirements from the customers come from a, a joint document, of the, the functional requirements document that gets approved by the, uh, J, the Joint Information Environment uh, Executive Committee. That is a controlling entity uh, over how JRSS is executed. Um, so that joint document that is, that is prepared 
uh, encapsulates uh, all of the different uh, requirements that each of the services or agencies has. So uh, they, they, they enter that process. Um, they have a, uh, they, they, we've had two different requirements documents already produced and approved, the 1.0 and the 1.5. Uh, the 2.0, I believe, is, is they're still working on the, the refinement of that. Um, to get that to be the, the next the, the, the generation of, of technology that we're going to be moving to. Um, but during these transitions, we're finding out that uh, not necessarily the technology, but the, the way you operate the system uh, needs to be refined. Um, and so we're getting more training for them. Uh, we're getting better dashboards for them uh, so they can understand what this new tool set is giving them. Because a, a lot of the, the services on their legacy architecture um, had uh, very strong pillars of excellence in one or two or three different disciplines within the, uh, the, the gambit of things that JRSS provides. Mm -hmm. And so they're realizing now that with all the other capabilities now that they have, uh, they, they've got some gaps and we're trying to, to fill those gaps as smoothly and as quickly as we can so that they can get back to the, the business of defending their networks. You kind of anticipated where I wanted to go next, which is what's the differentiation between what you're providing and the ability of these organizations to move away from being in the IT business so that they can concentrate on their warfighting missions. Right. So. so yeah, there, there are, as I said, each one of these, these services has their own, I would say, areas that they specialized in, that they, they had their, the things they were really good at, but none of them were good across the board at all the different things. And so they, 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 they reinforced success and got better at, at other things, and that, that was able to uh, potentially uh, cover other things that they were not able to, to get to through a different capability. So. Um, it, is, it has been interesting to see the different things that the, the different services are good at and even different regions of the different services uh, are good at or, 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 or uh, not as good at and, and trying to bring them all up to uh, at least the same environment um, and it's really on the service uh, to really generate that expertise in, in all of these different capabilities. Don't forget, if you miss an episode of Government Matters, you can find it on our website, govmatters.tv. I'm back in two minutes. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 11 on News Channel 8 and Sunday mornings at 1030 on ABC 7 to stay plugged in on issues that matter for the business of government. Thanks for watching. I'm Francis Rose.